I've got a special treat for you over the next three episodes. We go back to school. I'm going to talk to Philip Kotler, Kevin Lane Keller, as well as Byron Sharp. All of these individuals are world-renowned academics from Philip Kotler 50 years ago, starting the marketing management textbook that many folks still know and use in their business education. To Kevin Keller, his now co-author on that text, as well as pushing forward branding and strategic brand management. And finally, the newest comer to this group, Byron Sharp, who seven years ago published the book, How Brands Grow, is changing and breaking some of the myths of marketing. I hope you enjoy. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Philip Kotler, S.C. Johnson & Son Distinguished Professor of International Marketing at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. This year marks the 50th anniversary of his text, Marketing Management. It's in its 15th edition, and we talk a little bit about what's happened over the last 50 years and what still remains the same. See, Philip Kotler is many times dubbed as the marketing guru or the most influential marketer of all time. In 2014, he was inducted into the Marketing Hall of Fame, and he's written over 50 books over his career. We take a little bit more time to talk about his newest book, Confronting Capitalism, as well as stepping back and talking about what influenced his life and who he became today in developing some of the first early marketing models at Harvard University. And finally, we talk a little bit about the future of marketing as well as brands that he thinks are doing interesting things like Starbucks, Ikea, Apple, Amazon, and especially Unilever. Well, Philip, welcome to the show. Alan, I'm happy to be speaking to you. Well, it's an honor to be chatting with you today. I think most business school students like myself, or former business school students like myself, I should say, remember using your textbook. And I'd love to just get you to tell us a little bit about your background and and why you chose marketing. I know your, your background is in economics. Yes, my strong interest has been in the question of how the economy works and produces products and services and capital flows, and then shares the productivity and the innovation results with the workers, with the management, and with others. One problem that I have paid attention to is the growing inequality of income and whether it is excessive. And that led me to write two recent books, which brought me back to my economic writing, one called Confronting Capitalism, and the other called Democracy in Decline. So I became active in standing for a position, normally a liberal position, to make things better for more people, that capitalism has to perform better for more people and not just simply for rich people making them richer. I am in marketing also, and that came about in an interesting way that economists have neglected much about marketing. For example, they will say that a business can produce more demand by lowering the price. Now, that's very reasonable. But I know a business can produce more sales by also spending more money on promotion and advertising and better service. And they neglect that. They are so classical economics is so geared to price systems, pricing systems, that they don't realize there are so many different inducements affecting our decision to buy a product. Economists are so uninterested in the other inducements that can cause people to buy a product. And very little is written by economists about advertising, about service and about distributors like wholesalers, retailers. It's sort of like normally it's a relationship just between the company that manufactured something and the final consumer who bought it. And that's what demand and supply is all about. So I got interested in also bringing some rigor into the field of marketing. And one manifestation is that I've written about 60 books on different aspects of marketing. And the one called Marketing Management is now celebrating its 50th anniversary in a 15th edition. So I'd be glad to mention 
more about that book too. Well, yeah, I, I did notice it's a, it, it is the 50th year anniversary, and I'm curious after after that many years, what's still true about marketing today? Yeah, the foundational idea is that marketing is a customer oriented discipline. Its purpose is to help create goods and services that serve and satisfy the needs and wants of specific groups, market segments, and so on. So that hasn't changed. In fact, the, the book works very much on the idea of that we call segmentation, targeting, and positioning. You can't normally serve everyone well. As a matter of fact, if you try to take over a whole market, you'd have so many battles in so many parts of the market that you probably won't be very profitable. It's much better to define a group that has a real need that can be satisfied best by your firm, and you will own that market segment, and it will be normally a profitable relationship. So that is in every edition. What has changed is a number of things. Over uh, newer editions, I brought in more on the social impact of marketing because every marketing decision also has uh, some possible impact on our resources, on our communities, on our planet. And I call that maybe sort of the corporate social responsibility aspect of making decisions that make good products and services, but in a way that is not wasteful, is not harmful to communities, and so on. So that will appear in subsequent editions. The latest, then the next big idea was branding. Yeah. When I wrote Marketing Management First Edition, I, I gave a couple of pages to branding because it was just the, the simple idea of naming a brand and making it work well. But branding has become so important uh, that companies see themselves as basically building and managing brands and brands that can start with an original product and, and the name of the brand can then help launch other products that are not too dissimilar from the original product. So I invited my co-author, Kevin Keller, to join me in the 11th edition, I believe, approximately. And we've been working together on the Kotler Keller book. And so branding was added. And then Kevin and I both agreed about three editions ago that the digital revolution is not only real, but it's going to just turn marketing around. Marketing traditionally depends um, so much on the 30-second commercial, and that won't disappear. But really, it's such a mass statement, such a brief statement for a market. And most people have internet connections, and they have mobile phones, and they can learn so much more than is found in the 30-second commercial that we have to teach the next generation of marketers how to use social media, the internet, to reach not only send messages to different people, but maybe very specific messages to very specific people. Because with big data now and market analytics, we can actually customize or personalize our messages to come at the right time, at the right place, to the right person. So marketing has been changing in that way, and the 15th edition captures that. Now, you've, you've also recently published, I think, what you call Marketing 4.0, and it highlights digital even further. What was the impetus to write that book, and you know, what should CMOs be keeping top of mind? Well, you know, many CMOs, most of them I've met, have a copy of marketing management. In some cases, it's the first edition, whatever. And I and one guy came up to me and he says, would you sign the first edition? I said, not really. I don't want to. I hope you're not using it. That's uh, 1967 marketing. And I'm sure you're not learning about the internet. So I think that that's a great thing about marketing, that there are new things happening all the time. And you raised the question about why Marketing 4.0 appeared as a book when I said that the 15th edition has much of the digital in it. Because 
the textbooks are not bought by CMOs and top management. They already feel they've already done that by owning an, uh, owning an older edition. So I wanted a thinner book. I think our 4.0 is about 250 to 300 pages that would bring the digital picture much better into their mind. And we do a lot of things. We're very interested in newer concepts of marketing, the customer journey idea. Can you map the customer's journey from the time of being inspired to get interested in some product or service to the time they actually buy it? Can you create content? We call it content development that is not put out to consumers or prospects with a message, please buy this. Not at all. This is content that might interest our prospects and our customers and they will feel this company pretty much cares about me or is interested because they send me things that are kind of useful to me to know. So content work is new. Native advertising is new. Brand storytelling is new. And in the book, we try to bring out uh, predictive analytics and neural marketing and other new ideas. So it puts together in a small a number of pages, a new and consistent view of marketing practice. That's interesting. I mean, one of the one of the most topical things right now. I don't know if you saw the story, but recently, a P and G has cut back, I guess, on their marketing spend. In particular, they cut. I think. <laughs> I saw that. They cut, cut hundred million dollars in digital, and and there was. And their sales went up. Yeah, right. And there was no no negative. Like they were overspending. The idea, right. whole hint right. there is: see, P and G was one of the first companies to adopt the new digital materials and sites. I think they went up to about thirty to thirty-five percent of their budget in certain product categories using digital. Right. And that was good because I never felt that digital was going to take over a hundred percent. I thought it would probably be about 50% of the spend between the traditional media and the digital media. Now, maybe they overshot the 35% wherever they were, and that's good. But I hope no one takes that as an indication that we should completely go back to traditional, throw all of that huge amount of money in the 30-second commercial. Right. I think it's still largely about balancing, right? It's balancing in each company. There's no right proportion of right. traditional to digital. But I would say for most companies, they're under-digitalized, not over-digitalized. I would add that they need to hire digital natives. It's one thing for someone who never grew up with the digital world to try to learn it. It's another thing to have the guys who were digital natives, and many of them are millennials, of course, to get into the marketing department and show what they think they can do with it. Interesting. Let's talk a little bit more about the role of the chief marketing officer. It's a, it's a tough one and different one than other C-suite peers, especially the CEO. How do you think about that top marketer position? And the I think we need, we need that position very much. However, I will say that some people are calling it by other names and maybe – they are a little different. One, some people call that, uh, say, and not that it is the chief marketing officer. They say it's the chief customer officer, CCO, or they'll call it the chief revenue officer or the chief communication officer. And each has a different tone and meaning to it. But I would stick to the chief marketing officer. Maybe if you need someone called a chief customer officer to put him under the chief marketing officer. The chief marketing officer should bring two things to happen. One is to unify all the marketing skills and resources of the company, bringing, by the way, the training level to a high level because there's a lot of technologies now in marketing. There's a lot of esoteric things that can be used. And so make it a great marketing department. The second need is for the CMO to relate very well to the other business functions. First, to the CEO, who doesn't understand marketing in most cases, because he probably or she was a finance person rising to the top. 
someone mm-hmm. who knew the numbers and so on. Secondly, be very close to the chief financial officer because that person can, can make your job a nightmare if he keeps telling the CEO that too much money is being spent on marketing and he's not getting a measure of return on marketing assets or investments. Now, marketing cannot work unless the CMO has built a very good relationship, not only with the CEO and the CFO, but also the other people, the relations department, the manufacturing people, the purchasing people. And so that means that the CMO better not spend more than uh, 50% of his time fixing up the skilled level of his own marketing group. He's got to spend 50% of his time being with the others. And I would go further. Instead of the CMO being seen as only managing some marketing work that has to be done now that the company has products to sell and so on, but that the CMO should be participating in the in building the future of the company in participating in the business strategy, not just the marketing strategy, the business strategy of the company, because the CMO is in the best position to know where customers are going what they need and might want later, and therefore is in the best position to seize or see new market opportunities that are emerging. So I want marketing to be with the finance guy and the manufacturing guy and the product people when they try to figure out where to be going, where to be in five years from now. And that's a newer role, but it's not appreciated in many companies which want the marketing person to just manage the communications, let's say. Yeah, growth is a big a big part of where the company wants to go. You exactly. Know, it makes sense that marketing would be a leader in that area. What advice would you have on for CMOs or, or even other C-suite leaders as they look for finding those growth opportunities? I think many of them get revealed through uh, good segmentation work, which involves breaking down a whole market into segments of the market, some of which are overly satisfied and some are under satisfied. You may see that if that a certain segment is growing rapidly, it's more people with that need set, that collection of, of needs and wants in the, that product area, that's growing. And we want the, the chief marketing officer, if this is consumer marketing, to watch what's happening to demographics. Are women having more children or fewer children? Are men playing a role in the family or still being in the office most of the time? There's so many demographics move slowly, but they move. And we think that the opportunity identification is, by the way, everyone's job in the company, at least at management levels. They all should powwow about what they see as emerging opportunities. And sometimes you see it more in the form of what your competitor found out before you. And should you jump in and be the second competitor? Or should you let them own what they started as a ownership of a niche? I'm very much in favor of niche thinking. I'd rather see a company go after ownership of one or more niches than to go after ownership of the whole market like Coca-Cola has tried to do. Can you expound on that? Why niche versus the whole market? Well, because niche leaders, the leader in a niche, tends to gets to satisfy the, tends to know the occupants of the niche, the companies in that niche that are buyers or the customers that are buyers, and to do such a good job of uh, even anticipating their needs, let alone delivering on what is uh, already apparent, that they would be the first mentioned by people in that niche as a supplier, the preferred supplier. And therefore, the idea of owning three or four niches that are highly profitable, that aren't likely to evaporate on you very quickly, might be better than being in trying to satisfy a moving market of many people with different needs and having offers, many offers for different people. It's just a a belief I have that much of it comes from the work done by Hermann Simon in his book about niching. 
and the German companies that have been so successful in building up their businesses by being niche leaders. Interesting. I'll have to check that out. One of the things, I know this is shifting topics a little bit, but you mentioned it at the beginning. You've gotten back to your economist roots, if you will, in writing some recent books. And I wanted to talk a little bit about Confronting Capitalism. Yes. One of your newest books. And I'm curious, one, what maybe what drove you getting back to those roots? And then what are you trying to address in confronting capitalism? Yeah, I have a basic concern of the following kind, that we have 15% of our people are under the line of poverty. They are below what it takes to make not a livable living, but just to, to get enough to eat. Then there's another 40 or 50% who are living from paycheck to paycheck. As a matter of fact, when they get their paycheck, they go and borrow more to pay down something or to be able to buy something else. So there's such high indebtedness of the working class. And that is going to be fatal to the economy because if they don't have a share of the growing income produced by technological improvements, produced by productivity improvements, if they're not sharing in it, and we have evidence that they don't share in it because workers' wages have been the same in real terms since the 1980s. It's been flat since the 1980s. Now, if our population is getting poor, then factories are, we're going to be not only a slow growth economy, by the way, we are a slow growth economy, you know, 2% a year maybe. We won't have the factories operating as much because there isn't the money to buy all the things that people really would like to buy. Everyone wants to buy a, a better refrigerator or a better car or so on. The money isn't there unless you borrow it. So I'm even worried about the capitalists, that they're killing each other, that they're committing suicide. They're calling for pitchforks and a revolution, basically, by being so greedy. And paying higher wages, there's evidence in many places now, that companies that pay better than their competitors also get more from their workers. They get more loyal workers. They get harder working workers. And it pays in the end to be satisfying not only your customers, but your workers. The interesting thing is when you go to uh, Marriott Hotels, they say the customer is number two, not number one. You know, my book is premised on the fact that the customer is number one. No, they say the employees are number one. If you do not satisfy the people working for you, making the beds in the hotel, operating the front desk of the hotel, the people won't come back or have a good image of your hotel. And then you lost them. So both groups must be well rewarded, your customers and your employees, if you're going to be running a healthy, growing business. Interesting. I think it's an important message, too. Is there other lessons in there for marketers, do you think, besides just focus on employees as well as customers? I would go back to the fact that the book Marketing 4.0, which you raised questions about that, right. also delivers a new scheme for the customer journey and involves five or six stages. I have to go back to my the book to show you what the stages are. You know, uh, it's, right. it's the old one that used to be called AIDA, A-I-D-A, but we've improved that. But we can use some measures in those six steps that will be maybe feed into having a way to measure the return on marketing work we're doing. So it's a little complicated. and. This isn't the time to describe that, but that's another reason to go to that book 4.0. We had a wonderful message in 3.0. We talked about how important it is for companies not only to reach the mind of the buyer, functionally speaking, oh, this product will satisfy your immediate need, but reach the heart of the customer because so much buying is emotionally driven. But the third, Marketing 3.0 says, also reach the spirit of the customer. Show that you're a company that is very pro-social. That's an expression we use now. Pro-social means kind of paying attention to 
getting the society to work better for more people. And so Marketing 3.0 took that trichotomy, mind, heart, and spirit, and had many illustrations and studies about that. The 4.0 is much more uh, marketing aimed at the digital revolution. Great. Well, let's step back a little bit. I, I love to get to know the person as well that I'm interviewing. And one of my favorite things to ask is, was there an experience in your past that defines who you've become? Well, yes. I was one of the 50 people invited to go to Harvard as a professor when the Ford Foundation gave a huge grant of money to Harvard to teach more of the professors to become more quantitative. That is, Ford Foundation felt that a lot of business now was going to be much more sophisticated and require mathematical thinking as well as straightforward economic thinking. So 50 of us were chosen, and I, therefore, was in a program for one year learning. I knew my math, but this was higher and higher math, very sophisticated math, linear programming, nonlinear programming, dynamic programming, and, and so on. And in that group of 50 professors, this was in 1960 in Boston, we had several people from marketing, professors of marketing, several professors of finance, several professors of accounting. And I didn't know that much about marketing at the time. And I gravitated toward that group, which consisted of a group that became even more well-known, leaders in the field of marketing. There were about nine of us. And one of our interests in that group was to figure out, can we quantify, can we build mathematical models? What do we mean by that? How do we predict the sales? Well, we predict it as a function of not only the economy, but also of what price we set on the product, how well our product is respected, how good the service level is. And we were, for the first time, introduced the mathematics of marketing. And I wrote a whole book called, I forget the title of it, but it was uh, 800, it was 600 pages of mathematical analysis of marketing. And that was the turning point that got me deeply into marketing. That experience of being at Harvard for one year and choosing to work very closely with nine or 10 well-chosen people for the program who all wanted to learn mathematics better. Great. What keeps you going thinking about these tough problems? I am an inveterate lifetime learner. Right now I'm in Chautauqua in New York at an institution which started in 1847 and uh, we have nine weeks of wonderful lectures by very well-known people on all kinds of subjects as well as concerts at night and it's just part of my nature to want to learn and think about fresh answers to big problems. So, and the field of marketing keeps, look, if I was a student of geometry, which hasn't changed in 2000 years, I would probably be bored teaching geometry. <laughs> That's called the burnout effect of a lot of subjects where you're just repeating the same things over and over. Marketing is so exciting. I'm still excited by the number of questions we still haven't answered in marketing that keeps me thinking about it. I tend to agree with you on that. that marketing is, in many respects, studying behavior of people, and people love to change. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. It's well put. <laughs> You know, are there brands or companies or causes that you think other people should take notice of? I have my favorite brands. I mean, I love Starbucks and Howard Schultz and the way he thinks about his company and and expands what it does and all that. I like IKEA, IKEA from Scandinavia because of bringing down the cost of furniture and appliances and and so on. I like, of course, Apple very much for bringing into being so many wonderful products. Tim Cook seems to be doing a good job. And I am dazzled by Jeff Bezos and his Amazon empire building. He doesn't stop. I mean, from books to everything and to uh, different new ways to deliver products and so on. So I follow certain companies more often. 
in the consumer area, I still think I can learn a lot from Procter & Gamble, but I can learn even more sometimes from, Pro from Unilever. Unilever's president, CEO, is Paul Pullman. And Paul made a very ambitious uh, promise, in a sense. He said, I believe that we have to get the climate under control, and I believe we've got to make the whole world a better place for more people, and I'm going to still make profit for the company doing that. I can reconcile corporate social responsibility and profit making. So, and I think the recent things he has done with Dove and other products show kind of a, a new level of consumer marketing. Well, and it's definitely a theme, especially trying to confront issues of society. Yeah, yeah. And at Starbucks as well, you talk about treating employees well. I've heard stories and read a lot about how they do that themselves. Yeah, as well. Yes, they're outstanding in that sense. Uh, right. This is a fun question to ask someone like yourself, but where do you see the future of marketing going? I hope it goes more digital and yet not all the way uh, because there might be a clash between mathematical and scientific approaches to building a powerful marketing position and creative creativity. We marketing has thrived on very creative people, especially in the communications area, but you also want creative people in the product innovation area. And I would like the marketing staff to have a, a pretty good mix of digital and the mathematical scientific types and also creative and entrepreneurial types. A major question is how can you get a company to be successful as an innovator? Uh, companies that are large just want to keep going the way they've set up their product categories and they don't want to disrupt their own future. Uh, and yet they become targets for disruption by uh, smaller firms that can make uh, products uh, cheaper or better or something like that. So how does a large company remain innovative? And we have some examples of companies that have been innovative, but most of them are going to be sitting ducks for in a world where disruption is becoming the norm due largely to the digital revolution, that uh, right. people are creating businesses on the set of zeros and ones, basically, on digital analysis that they have to watch out for. I think every firm should sit have meetings of their people, their management people. How can we be disrupted? How would you disrupt us in that business of ours? And this would be by business by business. It's what we really call it's scenario planning. What are our vulnerabilities? Where would you go if you were attacking us? And I think that's a healthy thing to do because it's in the air more and more. Look at Kodak. I mean, now Kodak, the biggest irony in that company is that it was the creator of the iPhone. And right. they thought they weren't gonna give up selling film. And so they put it aside. And basically, uh, they even hired George Fisher to run the company because he was from Motorola and he was electrical, not chemical. But poor George, as try as he made, he, all the people were chemists and he couldn't replace them with engineers who thought about this new iPhone business. So I think the fate that uh, happened to them and, and partly to Motorola later, Motorola isn't what it used to be shows that some of the biggest companies in the world can go flat or out of existence. So that exercise of, of meeting your staff and saying, how might we be attacked and what should we do about it? And the answer half the time is we, we should be the attacker of ourselves. Why let someone else come out with a better product than we have? Let's attack our own business with a better product. Interesting. I like that idea. I like that idea a lot. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Well, thanks for your patience, Alan.
Marketing Today is brought to you by Atomic. Atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve. Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at Atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with project management by Sarah Williams, audio production by Aaron Campbell, writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. We love to hear from listeners at info at atomic, A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. <laughs>